Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. So, let's start. How many of you knows these books? Oh, nice. Most of all, this book was published in 2002, and uh, when I was uh, a young developer, and contains lots of uh, interesting patterns for enterprise application. And one of the most interesting pattern inside this book is the domain model pattern that tell us that we should model our, our object and our, our application using object and our object should contain both behavior and data. Until then, my apps were full of objects that are only um, anemic, uh, anemic entities. It contains only data and not behavior. After reading this book, I start to model an application trying to apply, as I understand, the patterns contained in this book. So I start a new big application with a, I had, I try to define my model, my domain models. A customer, a customer can have an invoice, invoice can be visited by item, customer have an address, address is tied to the city, the price, the contract, the, ro the, the contacts, the role, and so on. After a few iterations, I had a very big domain models where all the objects are interconnected with the others. And that some seems to me awesome because I can start from, from the city, and from the city I can navigate through the address to the customer and get all the contracts that are signed by a certain city. I can do lots of things, um, it seems to me, it seems so. I can do a lot of things with, with this big graph of objects interconnected. The first problem comes when I try to persist this graph to a database. At the time, the application was written in C Sharp, in .NET, and I had to use uh, an ORM like Hibernate to persist these object models to the database. And it was a pain, a real pain. The problem is that this, mo this domain model is a, comp is a one monolith of code. All the concerns of the application is, the, is the built inside the same piece of code. And it's very difficult to separate them in different concerns. In 2003, 2004, exactly, this book came out. Who knows this book? Well, a little bit less, but some of you. This book is uh, one of the most difficult books, in one sense, to understand. I read it three times to understand all the things that it contained. But uh, if you read this book after the Pattern of Enterprise Application Architecture, this book explains very well where I did wrong my design in the past. Because this book explains how the main model pattern should be applied really in the real, in real world application. So during this talk, I would like to show you two different approach uh, for our race application. My name is Emanuele Delbono. I come from Italy. I work as a software developer in a small company called Calcio Plastico in Italy. Actually, I'm not a Ruby developer. That's fine. I'm a wannabe Ruby developer. I do C Sharp for money and Ruby for fun in the evening and the night. Uh, okay, let's start. Everybody, not Java, <laughs> but it's almost the same. Let's start with lasagna architecture. Everybody knows this kind of architecture pattern. I know how to cook lasagna because I'm an Italian, so I'm very well in that. And uh, our space application is something like lasagna architecture. It has the view on the top, the view communicated with to, to uh, with the controller. The controller uses the model through Active Refor to persist the data on the database. What's wrong with this? Well, actually nothing. If the application is quite simple, there's nothing wrong with this, with this architecture. But if the application becomes bigger and the, the model part becomes bigger, so if, if you have lots of models class, persisting them to database is not so easy as it seems. That's why we use an ORM. In, in the case of Rails, the ORM is Active Record. And Active Record is one of the patterns contained in the Pattern and the Project Architecture book. And Martin Fowler described the active record pattern like as an object that wraps a row in a database table. 
it's simple. You have one row in the database table, you have one, one object in your domain, in your application. That's easy, but if the model change, the database change. And in the domain model pattern, one of the constraints, one of the, um, the good points that it takes out is that you can, that is that Martin Fuller says that you can model your domain without thinking at the database. And the database and the domain model should evolve independently. With active records, it's very difficult because in most of the case, our, um, we, have, we have one class and one table. In most of the case, not, not always, but that's the usual case. That means that our application, our model, is too coupled with the database structure. In, in, in some sense, our domain model is just a copy of the database in memory. Okay. So we have the problem with the queries, with the lots of joins. We have the n plus one problem during while querying the data with that are lazy loaded. We violate the single responsibility principle because our models have two concerns: the persisting concerns and the domain logic concerns. So it does two things. And the other thing is that in our race application we start always thinking in terms of database because when we scaffold our models or when we project our models, we, are st we start thinking about the database model. Another point is that we are using the same model for the get and the post for reading and writing data. So in the post we use, in the get operation we use uh, something like this, products all to load all the products from the database and return to the view. And in the case of creation we use the same model to create a new product in the database. Another guy, Greg Young, that is uh, one of the most influential architects in during this last year, said that a single model cannot be appropriate for reporting, searching, and transactional behavior. But, and that's what we are doing. We are using a single model for query data from the database and for writing data to the database. And reading and writing probably are a little bit different, if you think about it. Reads and write are in reality two different constraints because reads are simpler. We just have to query the data from the database and put it on the view. Nothing more. Sometimes some little formatting issues, some um, internationalization, but nothing more. While writes are more complex because write needs validation, I needs authorization, needs business logic to, to, uh, to write the data to the database. Another point is that for our user, uh, the database is not important. It doesn't care about the fact that when he click on that button, something is, read, is get written in the, database, in the database. For the user, this is not important. For the user, this form activates a new contract. It's a business operation. And activity, act activating a new contract probably means sending emails to someone, means create a new new documents in the document system, means probably um, start a new workflow for contacting the customer and sending uh, documents to him and so on and so on and so on. But we as a developer, especially in Ray's application, continue to think in terms of insert and read from database. So my first advice is keep calm and stop thinking in crude. Don't, you, don't, you should stop to think in terms of insert, read, delete, update in the database because we are building applications that are used by users that need business operation. And if we start changing our mentality, we arrive to the first um, architectural pattern that we will present today, that is common query responsibility segregation. The idea is that write and read are two different concerns. And so we have, to re we have to add to have two stacks, one for reading, and one for writing, completely different. A possible implementation is something like this. So we have a presentation layer, it could be our controllers, for example, that sends command to this green area. Every command, where the command is create a contract, add an item to the basket, do something, and so on. The commands are managed by an handler that do some stuff, apply business logic for writing stuff, so the complex business logic is here and write the data to the, to the write database. The write database is then denormalized in a read database by the, the normalizer 
layer that prepares the, the normalizer prepares the data just to be read as quick as possible. And we have here a query service, very, very thin service, just to query data from the database. In the optimal case, here we have one table per view. One, that means every view in, the, in our web application is a, a, a table here. What does this mean? This means that the reads are very simple because for reading, for presenting data to our user, we just have to select star, select fields from table, eventually where something. It's just a single query, no joins, no subqueries, simple query. Writes become easier too because we have a database that is structured to be, it is fully normalized, to be um, used by the right concerns. Okay? This is the first step. Naturally, it's not so easy to implement this part because in some way we have to denormalize the data and the two database not needs to be synchronized all the time because we have, uh, otherwise we have dirty rates. Okay. Go on a little bit. This is the first, first step. We can do a little more. In our database, in our databases, usually the data is persistent in something like this. So in tables, where each row of a table represents uh, an object, and it contains the state of an object. So in this case, the basket number four, basket ID four, contains the article eight with quantity one and the article five with quantity one. Contains two items, okay. And the state of our object is de defined by this table. Nothing special here. But we miss something here because we don't know how we arrived in this situation. Okay, this is just a snapshot of the present um, state, but we miss how the state was yesterday, two days ago, last week, and so on. It is like uh, if mm, uh, the, um, our bank statement will be only will, will be formed only by the totals. If we receive the bank statement with only the total, we miss how we get there, how we have, how, why we are in red in this case, why we are in this situation. The bank statement all, uh, um, send us the totals and all the story that brings us to these totals. So we can rebuild these values just summing this, the, 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 all the movement that we did in the, in the past. If we use this approach, the same approach in our application, something begins to change. So we can start thinking in events. Every change we, did, we do at our, our system, the, the, the users do with our system, is an event. And if we, pers if we persist the events, we can rebuild the state starting from events. Okay? So if we store the fact that the user add an item, add item two, remove item one, add item three. At the time here, we, we know that our basket contains the item two and the item three. But we also know that in the past, he, he had the item one and removed the item one. So from a marketing perspective, it could be interesting to know that some customer add something in the basket and then remove it. Because the marketing could make an offer to that user a sort of, sort of discount. Maybe you are interested in this article, but probably it's too, it's too expensive for you. I can do a, a discount for you. So there are more information that we collect in our database. And we can also travel in time because we can rebuild the state of our, of our basket until here with when, when there is only one article in the, in, the, in the basket. This type of architecture is called event sourcing. That means Martin Fowler said that capture all changes to an application state as a sequence of events. So we don't store the, the actual state of our object, but we, state, we store only the events. Okay. So this opens, um, as opens for lots of other uh, uh, way of uh, resolve our problem. One of these is traveling in time. I said just before, we can rebuild the state as it was 
yesterday, two weeks ago, one year ago. And we can generate new heavens to simulate new, uh, new, uh, stuff, new happenings in the future. We can simulate what happens if we had more items in the basket or something like this. We can generate heaven to, to travel in time. The general architecture of a uh, level sourcing uh, um, schema is something like this. Okay. It reminds the CQRS architecture. It's a little bit more complex, and this is one of the possible implementation. There are others, but this is one of the, the possible implementation. The presentation layer sends a command to the handler. In this case, I, add, I added also in a, in a message bus, RabbitMQ, Redis, or some Redis pops up, or something like that. So we can completely decouple the application layer, that is the part of the Rails uh, controllers and views, from the the part that handles the, the, our commands, that are different process in this case. Of this block, we can have, we can have more than one. Okay, I, I add a line around. We can have different instances of this, and every instance handles a, cup, a group of heavens, a group of commands. The handler loads from the heaven store the state of the object that we, are, we, we need to use. Okay. In this case, this, the, uh, here we don't, we don't have a real database. We, do, we just have an event store. Event store is just a list of events that we have stored uh, in the past. So from the events, we can rebuild the state of the actual object and call methods using the domain model pattern. Okay. Every method that we call on our object generates new events to, to tell the hardest that something is changing inside. These events are captured, are, are gathered by the, the, by the normalizer that prepares the data for reading. Okay? And the query service reads from the read database and exposes the data from the, to the, the, the user. So here we have an event store and the read database. What are the pros and cons of this type of architecture? First of all, it's a full encapsulation. We can model our domain, our object, our classes, in a, without thinking at the storage, because the store in the, the, our classes are not really stored. We store only the heavens. So we don't have to deal with mapping to a, with an ORM or something like this. And our object doesn't have attributes, usually. They, they doesn't have accessor. They just have methods that do, some, that do operation on them. So the domain model is fully encapsulated. Separation of concerns. Our object is just there for writing concerns and not for reading concerns. The storage is very simple. In the, in the example that I will show you later, I using, I'm using MongoDB to store the heavens, but you can use whatever you want to store just a, a, a stream or heavens of simple object that has a name and an array of arguments. You can use also Redis or something like that. The storage is very simple. You don't need active record. You don't need hibernate. You don't need you know, a real ORM. Performance and scaling are better because we can add more instances of our handlers to manage more commands in a unit of time. It's very easy. Testing is easy because the unit that we are going to test are just uh, the, the, the object of the domain models. We call method on them and, they are in anal and verify that the events that we expect are raised correctly. That's all. We don't need mocking or other complicated stuff to test our classes. More information granularity because we collect a lot more information, probably more than we need to, to our application, but since it's very easy to collect information, it's better to collect and have the information in the st event store for future use. So in the future, could be the, our customer could ask us more new functionality that you can use even for data that is not, uh, is, is even for data that is persisted a year ago. Another part is the easy integration with the other services because we cannot use the database as an integration tool, but we use event for integration tool. So if we need that uh, to communicate with our invoicing system, 
we don't have to build an ATL that transfers the data from the database of our application to the database to the invoicing system. We can just write a new consumer that intercepts the heavens interest that uh, the, uh, the invoicing system needs, and it, using this heaven can do the operation on the invoicing system. So there are lots of pros, but there is also some cons. Naturally, it's very, quite complex to build the full infrastructure for simple, for simple scenarios. Simple scenarios where you have some tens or 20 classes and doesn't work build all this kind of infrastructure. For the cost of infrastructure itself, we have a message bus like RabbitMQ or Redis or ZeroMQ or stuff like this. You have two different databases a relational database for querying and an event store for writing. So there are two uh, other two pieces of infrastructure to maintain. So the cost is not so small. We have uh, the problem that long, long, long living objects needs time to be reconstructed. If you think that an object is, uh, is live for, from two years, it probably has tons of events in the database, in the event store. And whenever you need the actual state, you have to re-execute all the events from the beginning till now. And probably if the, the time passes and the, the, the object is old, rebuilding the actual states could be very expensive. For this case, we usually use the snapshot. We do, for long living object, we do um, a weekly snapshot of the application. We store the weekly state in a different database. So uh, every day we have to rebuild the state at maximum from one week ago. So we start from one week ago and we apply only the event from that one week ago to, to, to now. This is a solution for the problem of long living object. So, the last part is that we need tool because we don't have a database with the state. That means where we can jump into the database and update the data if the bug comes out. We don't have the, the, the console to, the, to Postgres or to, to MySQL to, inter, to fix a bug in the insert or in uh, something like that. We have to build our own tools to regenerate the event, to re-execute the event, or to change the event that we have generated if the book is there. And there isn't tool, there aren't tools in, in the market, so you have to build our own scripts to do this kind of stuff. So I try to build this infrastructure, this sample application in Ruby and Rails. Um, we have this kind of architecture uh, in production from almost a year now. The application is built in C Sharp, uh, so in the, in the Microsoft stack. And uh, since I'm a Ruby lover, I try to convert the, the, the whole infrastructure in, uh, in, Ruby, in Ruby and Rails. Because uh, I thought, and, and uh, I win in this, that with Ruby, it's get m it could be much more simpler um, developing this kind of architecture. Because Ruby is a very expressive language, very compact language. It doesn't have uh, all the celebrations in, uh, that you need in uh, C-sharp or Java. And so I thought that with Ruby could be much easier. And the quantity of code that I write to, uh, to create this proof of concept, because it's just a proof of concept, it's quite less than the, the equivalent C-sharp part. So the mini application that I create is built uh, on, a regular, on a race application without active record, actually. I use uh, Redis with the PubSub uh, feature to communicate, to make the communication from the controller to the consumer of the messages. I use SQL for querying the data in the, in the read database. And SQL is used, used plain in the controller. I use MongoDB as an event store. SQLite is as a read database. And I use Whisper for domain events. Whisper is a gem that uh, implement the PubSub in process in, uh, in Ruby application. So our domain model is very, for the, this modification is quite simple. It's just a, a basket management uh, application. It has a basket class that contains a, a collection of basket item. 
and an article class. This, this is an aggregate in terms of domain-driven design. So these two class makes an aggregate, okay? The basket doesn't not, have no assessor, it's fully OP. Use even for communication they are, and are pure uh, plain, object, plain object Ruby. So, some code. I start from the controller. The controller receives a post from the, from the view to add to basket an item, okay? The controller inclu include this module that is a common executor. And all, all what the, um, the action should do is to send a command of type add to basket command with the correct parameters. Okay, that's all. So all the right, the right operation usually send the command to somewhere and return to the new, to the new or to the new view. That's all. It's very easy. So don't, you don't have lots of code here. The common executor is a method send command that received the, uh, received the, the command itself and send it to Redis using the the ch as a channel name, the name of the class, the name of the command in this case, and the command data as a to JSONified to communicate. So from here, we go out to the process of Rails and enter to the back end. So the bus delivers the message to the handler, and the handler consumes the message, the command. Usually, a consumer is very simple too. It has to get the actual state of the basket and the article, reading from the event store. I read this from event store. Given that this is an add to item command, I simply call basket.addItem, passing the new article that it ju it was just added to the, to the basket, and I call a basket.commit to commit the data to the store and send the events. The basket in the add item a method, sim simply raise an event. It does nothing if not raise an event. The raise event method is given to the basket by the aggregate root helper module that we'll see later. So it received the add item with the item uh, as a parameter. It raised the event item added, passing the information about the item. The raise event method is in uh, the um, aggregate root helper, the module collect the, the, the event in a collection of uncommitted events because it's stored in memory for now, the events that are raised, and call a method send on item added, in this case, passing the args. So it goes back to the, to the basket class. The, add, uh, or the on item added uh, method on basket, here we are in on, on the basket object, do the real stuff. So it adds the item to, the to its own collection or, create, uh, or increase the quantity if the item is already present. Nothing more, okay. So we receive the command. We call add item to the basket domain, the basket object. The basket object uh, collect the event in the collection of uncommitted events and change its own state, okay. On the commit, the last thing that the handler does is the commit. That means that you should persist all the events that the domain models have generated in this uh, transaction. So it took all the, com the committed events present in the, com in the collection, uh, store it to the event store using this events, events uh, repository, and send the event to other interested classes. So send the event outside. The event store is, uh, uh, like I said before, is a uh, MongoDB in our cases. It's just a long list of event where each event has an aggregate ID that represent, in this case, the basket ID that I'm in considering. And it has a collection of arguments as an array. The, and uh, the, name of the, sorry, the name of the event is also important. Then other metadata information for ordering the, 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 the events or know who, who, are the, who issued the events and so on. The last thing that the, our commit does is send event. So the send event, that we, we said that 
raise the heaven for other interested uh, objects in, the, in the, our application, and the denormalizer is one of them. The normalizer should receive the heavens that the, the domain model raised and persist them and prepare the readDB to be read by the view. So the, the, the denormalizer uses SQLite. It's just, uh, this is just SQL code to update the basket view. That is a table on the database that represents the actual state of the, of the view, of the basket, sorry. Okay, so this is just a SQL query. The read database is something like this. It's something that is ready to be shown to the view, to the user. So we have, it's, a full, it's not fully normalized, it's completely denormalized because, for example, here we have the name of the articles that is added and the actual price for, of the article. Because the, the, uh, the part that reads the data from the, this read database should be something very easy. So still, you, uh, again, using uh, um, SQL, we, this is a get in the controller. The product is DB, DB uh, of basket view. So we are just reading the data from the basket view without any joins and so on. And so we have completed the, our joins, okay? Our tour, okay? From the, from the controller, we issue a command to the bus. The command goes to the handler. The handler loaded the, uh, rebuild the state of our object and call methods, call methods on them. Commit the heavens. The heavens are intercepted by the denormalizer. The denormalizer prepares the view. And the controller reads through the view to show the actual state of the, of the, uh, of the basket in this case. Seems a long tour, but most of the code is infrastructural code. It's not application code. And once the infrastructure code is up and running, it's very easy to add a new functionality or to modify other functionality. Consider that our unit of work is the handler. So we, our job is just to modify or adding new handlers for commands that come to the, from the UI. So the conclusion is our stop thinking in crude, first of all, but start thinking in terms of business operation. Okay? The user doesn't care about your database. Reads and writes are different. So the first step could be to separate the, the writing parts. You can, all, you can just use Active Record if you want, and, and read parts. Domain models should be based on, on plain old Ruby object without in the cost of infrastructure of other base classes and so on. CQRS and uh, or and event sourcing are very useful in complex scenarios in what's so-called enterprise applications. And uh, Ruby helps a lot compared with static languages like Java and C Sharp for infrastructure code because it's very easy with some of metaprogramming and uh, the fact that Ruby is very, um, is very speaking as a language, it's very easy to implement that. Uh, here you can find uh, the code of the simple application that I created. You can, uh, you can give me hints to, to make the code a little bit better because probably it's not like a Ruby developer write it, but I tried it. And uh, I'm here for questions. If you want to see the code, we can just sit around and do some hacking together, and that's all. Thanks, Emmanuel. Questions? Uh, hi. So, hi. first thing, uh, I find this architecture quite interesting, but I would really like to know how you deal with atomicity and data consistency. Because let's just imagine that you get an event twice. Let's say you try to remove the same item from the basket. Uh, okay. How do you um, deal with this? Uh, one thing that I didn't say is that our system is eventually consistent in the sense that when I go back to this schema, okay, because um, the fact that there is a bus, enterprise bus here, means that the operation is asynchronous, okay? So that means that when the user click add to basket, it needs time to, to the item to go directly on the basket, okay? And so the user needs one second or two seconds to see that the item is, already, is, is exactly in the basket. 
and we have to deal with it. But it's like Amazon World, for example. When you had, uh, when you complete an order on the Amazon, it needs time to the probably the your book is not yet in the, your order list in uh, immediately, but you need some second to do it to, for this. And so we have to deal with it, and our users should be informed about that. But probably it's not immediate that the item goes in the basket, but needs some seconds to, to do it. The atomicity is guaranteed by the handler itself. The repository and the domain model object, the aggregate, should um, must uh, guarantee the atomicity of the operation. So you don't have problem in that case. You're not, you're not sure? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> we can, we can sh write some code and to, to explain. You said that uh, database tables yeah. should be uh, easy to read. Yes. And they should be uh, just you read the table and you uh, show the data in the view. Yeah. Don't you think, think it could be a problem because the view is uh, really tightly coupled to the database? So when a user changes uh, his requirements, you have yes. to migrate your read database. So. Uh, Probably you have to always change the yes, but in that in this case, this database is built exactly for the view. We have, you have one table for each view of your application. So if in your, in your view you need the, the name of the item, the price of the item, and the quantity of the items, you will have a table with exactly the three columns. It's tightly coupled, but we need that it's tightly coupled because it, it's. In this case, the benefit, okay, in terms of performance, because you don't, it's very easy to query the data, it's very performant to read the data and put it on the view. Because the read part doesn't contain logic. Okay. Uh, how do you handle errors, so exceptions? Um, ah, good question. This is uh, one of the hard part, probably, because uh, errors happens here, and that means when, when an error happens, the user doesn't see, didn't see, don't see the, the operation completed. In our application, we have a sort of uh, bar on the top that shows eventual error that happens during the, applica during the application. So all the errors are intercepted by a, by a, a denormalizer that is interested in only in errors. They normalize the, the information to the read database. And there is a, a, to a web, using a web, web socket communication we inform the user that the, op the last operation didn't go well. It's not uh, perfectly a guarantee because the user can, see, can close the browser and didn't see the error, but it's the only option that we had now. Other questions? Uh, here. Uh, right. yeah. Okay, uh, so what happens if uh, the, the event changes? For example, the add to basket event uh, has to change in no, the process. The event it cannot change. It, yeah, because you can rewrite cannot, the history. You cannot recreate it. Then, what? Yeah? You cannot recreate when we will, you will change the process. So it's impossible, like, to change the event. No, when, I, once I, you read, uh, write the the event, it stays and it, it's it's yes. not able to 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 uh, develop. It's better to do this, in, in the sense that you cannot rewrite a history. The event stores contain the, the history. You cannot rewrite the history because rewriting the history, you know, that <laughs> could have big impact on us now. But actually, it's not so difficult because if you want, you can stop the system. You can uh, modify the, the events in the event store and rerun all the normalizer from the beginning of the history till now. It could take time. It could take one day or two if the Heaven store is bigger. Our heaven store contains millions of, rock, of rows now. So, but you, you can do it. You can, you can fix error in the past, that means. You can. It's not considered a good operation, but it's okay. Um, you said that you have a um, table for each view. So if uh, you have multiple views in your um, application, um, yeah. And you have even like add item to the basket. Yeah. Um, won't it happen that the uh, data in database is multiplied uh, yeah. a lot? Yeah, 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 completely. We have uh, lots of denormalized data, duplicated data in this database, only in the read part. It's completely denormalized and duplicated. 
But the, the important thing is that the truth of your status is here. This can be recreated just re-executing all the heavens. So this is the important part, the heavens. This part, okay, it's just, uh, just there for reading. You can, the normalize, you can modify it very often because if the customer needs a new field in the, a new field in the form or in, uh, in a table, for example, in a HTML table, you can add the, um, the row to a, to a table that, of that view and re-execute all the heavens to fill that field. So it's quite easy. Um, you sp you, it probably this co consumes lots of space, a lot of space, this one, because it's fully normalized. Any more questions? All right, then. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm here. Yeah.